Okay, so um, the session's now being recorded. Thank you everyone for coming this weekend. I know this is a long weekend. Many of you had plans. Um, well, I love the persistence and the, uh, the stamina to keep going. So I just wanna say thank you guys for coming. Um, our topic for today, we're gonna cover CPR week one material. Um, we're gonna give you this, this week, surprisingly, is a big portion of the exam that you guys are gonna get tested on. Um, a lot of clinical correlates. If, if, once you have the foundations for this, you guys would be essentially set up for the physiology lectures that are going to come on um, in the next couple of weeks. Now, the session ID is LubDub S1, S2, um, a little, little heart themed. So feel free to sign in. We have a couple of questions, um, but we will be doing a lot of content review um, for you guys today. Okay. okay. Before we get started, the slides should be on our Facebook page. Uh, it should be Sparkles um, on Facebook. If you're not part of it, go ahead and um, try to join it. I'll approve you right now. We also should have, I believe, Lexi here for, I don't know if she's going to be here the whole time, but uh, Lexi can answer some of your questions in the chat. I will be answering questions. Kishore will be. So if you guys have any questions, just put them in the chat. You can direct message me, Kishore, or Lexi if she's still here. Awesome. Okay. Let's get, Let's get started. So the first thing, this is our sparkles, and here's the T group. So feel free to join, like Sarah said, and we will definitely approve you. Okay. So first thing you guys have to remember is that the cardiovascular system is essentially the factory that keeps you running, right? It's the circulatory system. It basically provides uh, blood supply and oxygenated blood and nutrients and everything to the rest of the body. If this shuts down, basically everything shuts down. So that's why CPR is super, super critical. You will learn about it over and over again. Um, what you need to first realize is that the heart is composed of four chambers, right? We're going to go through the exact anatomy of those things, but I personally like to think of the heart as two separate um, systems, right? The, the right half deals mostly with the pulmonary system, right? That's your pulmonic circulation. It allows for deoxygenated blood to enter the lungs, and from there, it gets oxygenated and comes back into the right side, and allows, sorry, not the right side, the left side to then get into circulation, systemic circulation. So that's what you have to divide the system up into. Two systems, right? Systemic circulation and then the pulmonary circulation. Keep that in mind, super important. Always, always divide the system into two because they really teach it like two systems, right systemic, sorry, left systemic, right um, pulmonic. Let's go through these um, in a bit. Cool. Now, the cardiovascular system, two pumps in a series, right? We're talking about in series. Everything runs in a series except for when you get to your particular organs. That's when you get into the parallel system. Now, why is this set up this way? It's set up this way because we wanna make sure that the flow of blood is unidirectional and that initially, whether it's going to the lungs or to the heart, that it's not you know, bifurcating or going any other places. Once it reaches the targeted organs, that's when it starts moving into the parallel system. The parallel system, if you guys remember your physics back in the day, it allows for the establishment of, or the decrease of pressure on the organs or systems that are gonna be running through this. So keep in mind, you want less pressure, right? If everything's in a series, pressure is eventually going to build up at some point. That's why when you have it in parallel, it allows for the slowing down of blood and that blood can then have proper gas exchange, nutrients exchange, as well as the waste removal. All of these things you're gonna cover more in depth with microcirculations and other DLAs in the future. So it's important that you guys have a core foundation in this and we can kind of um, move on from there, right? Always remember, two systems, two halves make a whole. Cool. Great philosophical. Here they are in kind of the series. Remember, this is what I'm talking about. The brain, kidneys, gut, heart muscles, and the lower limbs all run in a parallel system, whereas your major, you know, vessels, they all run in a series. So, you know, they have, they can ask you questions about this based off of uh, like, you know, very simple terms of like, where would you find the highest pressure? And all of those things eventually add up to you covering a lot of the cardiac 
physiology, as well as microcirculations and et cetera. Parallel, all of the organs, just keep that in mind. And we'll go through a lot more. So cardiac output is roughly five liters per minute. Um, just keep that in mind. And we're gonna go over a couple of the equations that you need to know now, and eventually you will start to build on, okay? So um, just to kind of switch things up, we have little hearts next to each of the slides that are high yield important that eventually get you know, added for the details. So make sure you guys, you know, keep an eye on these slides. We've marked several of those um, and these slides are posted. So first thing you guys have to remember is stroke volume. It is the volume of blood ejected from the ventricles on each beat, right? Like each contraction of the ventricles is going to eject a certain amount of volume. And that volume is gonna be changed based, based off of how much you put into the heart, right? That there you're gonna get into the preload, afterload and all those things. Sarah will cover, cover a lot of the cardiac physiology with you guys. Ejection fraction is the fraction of the end diastolic volume ejected in each of the stroke block. So we're gonna go over this. These equations tend to be interconnected. They will ask you to kind of manipulate these equations. So the sooner you learn them, the faster you guys are gonna be with manipulating the variables eventually to get your answer. Cardiac output was the one that we got tested on a ton. It is cardiac output equaling stroke volume times heart rate. And if you guys remember your sympathetics and parasympathetics, they're gonna basically change a lot of these variables and eventually have downstream effects on your organ, um, perfusion, as well as function. So we'll get into a lot of the physiology when you guys, um, when, we, when we get further down the CPR rabbit hole. So the first thing I believe you guys covered was histology. So we're gonna spend some time on that. Um, I did assign you guys some homework at the tail end, but we will kind of get you guys started off with a quick turning point question. So session ID is lubdub S1, S2, feel free to sign in. And I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer this one since it's a nice short one. Thirty seconds sounds good. Okay, let's see how we did. Let me check this, that's not in the way. Exactly, guys, nicely done. The answer is atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis is super important. You know how like they, every physician, every like doctor will keep on saying like, you know, make sure you have a balanced nutritious diet and not having too much fat and everything. They're gonna, they're gonna harp on this a lot with the trots lectures, but you guys were absolutely correct. It is atherosclerosis. Now, don't get it twisted with arteriosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis is completely different. It is um, dealing with the calcification of the actual arteries. Like, you don't need to know it for now. What you do need to know is atherosclerosis. Now, there's a lot of very buzzwordy things with this. Um, remember with this, if you see like foamy cells, that tends to be a buzzword for atherosclerosis as well as um, fibro fatty plaques. So just keep that in mind. Um, the physiology of it, you guys need to know, which I'm gonna kind of outline here. You need to remember LDLs um, and the excess LDLs and what they do, how they get oxidized by the myocytes, and then they get you know basically macrophaged and then turn into the foam cells. But we will get more into this. You will cover a lot more material on this, the exact you know function, everything. So don't don't worry. Um, you don't need to know it super in detail right now, but just remember fibro fatty plaques. Let's do another question. Sorry guys, I just realized I gave you guys one extra question, answer choice. And so when, when I'm chatting, feel free to DM Sarah, Lexi, Armand, because they're here. Um, I'm, I'm like not looking directly at the chat. So promise, um, I promise you I'm not ignoring you.
Okay, let's see how we did. So we were definitely split on this and I can, I can understandably see why, but the answer here is C. This, these are dealing, what, what type of cells are these guys? Whether put it on the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. What tissues are these? Muscle. Muscle, exactly. Now we're asking you guys the capillaries and trust me, the histo that they give you on this, it's gonna feel like super unrelated and it's gonna, they're basically gonna follow it up with what capillaries are here? And you're like, wow, great, perfect. What you need to remember are the specific type of capillaries associated with each tissue, each organ, and some of the unique ones. So we're gonna go over those. Um, the answer here is C, endothelial cells joined by numerous tight junctions lying on the continuous basal lamina. Now I'll tell you guys how I learned it. So the continuous somatic capillaries, right? This is what we're, this, is, this was the answer, right? That's the characteristics are the continuous basal lamina, uninterrupted endothelium and tight junctions. Now look at all of the that, all of the locations that it's going to, connective tissue, muscle tissue, um, nerve tissue, exocrine glands, and the cerebral cortex. If you guys kind of think about it, right? Like intuitively you work through this, um, what you need to remember is that these structures and tissues have to be separated. They have to be separated from everything else and they don't, they, they can't be influenced by the stuff that's in the blood. So, that's why you have these nice continuous somatic capillaries so that your blood and the components in the blood doesn't really intermingle. Of course, certain things can diffuse through and that's fine, but we don't want direct vasculature messing it up in like, you know, your nervous tissue, right? You don't want blood in your nervous tissue. There's like a whole like um, brain function, blood brain barrier. <clears throat> Sorry, slightly losing my voice there. <laughs> Um, so you have a nice barrier, whereas your fenestrated capillaries, right, you want it in certain structures that it's going to allow for filtration or potentially function related changes, right? So think about your peptide secreting endocrine organs, ciliary process of the eyes, the kidney glomeruli, as well as the lamina propria of the GIT, right? All of those locations very large structures likely can pass through. So you want certain levels of opening and that's why they're fenestrated and allow for that opening, right? So they will still have the continuous basal lamina, but they will have um, these kind of porous structures. So if you guys can look at these histos and put them into context of where you can find in each location, it's gonna be super helpful. The discontinuous or the sinusoidal ones are like the super open ones. They're found in the liver, spleen, and bone marrow. And that's because remember, a lot of things get filtered and processed in the liver, as well as the spleen. Think about your RBCs, all of your bad RBCs. You're gonna learn this later on too. Whereas if you have sickle cell anemia, all of those sickled cells will get caught in these kind of um, mesh-like network of the discontinuous sinusoids, and they, they basically get macrophaged and broken down. So that's why there's most of the things in anatomy and histology, form equals function. So if you can kind of keep that, it's gonna help you a lot. Um, definitely memorize this. These are like very, very tested and they love it. So let's do another question, getting more into histo. Okay, let's see how we're doing. So you guys were saying this is the tunica media. Nicely done. Um, we were split a little on the intima and the um, myocardium. Don't worry, we'll kind of go over these. Let's kind of break down this um, histo slide. The tunica intima, I like to think is intimate with your vasculature, right? Like the actual blood. So that's intima, tunica intima is right here. The A is what? 
with your tunica media. Tunica media, absolutely, right? Media, I like to think of the medium by which it does its function. So that's like the nice thick layer. And finally, those who tend to go outside in the pandemic are very adventurous and they're potentially problematic. And that's why this one is the tunica adventitia, right? So that's how I like to kind of break it down um, histologically. Cool. Nicely done. We were looking at the media. And that is the answer. Now, I know why you guys would have gone with the myocardium. Um, remember, when they specifically talk about vasculature and it's not dealing with the heart directly, and if it's talking about the aorta or one of the other vessels, right, it's always going to be named off of intima, media, or adventitia. When you're in the heart, that's when the definitions switch over to endothelium, myocardium, um, sorry, um, yes, endothelium, myocardium, and um, what's the other layer? My brain is like, took, took a mini pause there. Epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. There we go. I don't know why that took me so long to get to that. Thanks, Armand. Um, but these are the layers. So know these well. Um, now, I remember specifically when we were learning them, they did want us to know the unique properties of each layer of whether it's like you're talking about like one of your major vessels versus one of your minor vessels. So for this, specifically in the aorta, 40 to 60 layers of elastic lamellae. Now, you guys remember your elastic fibers, right? So what is one of the pathologies associated with the elastic fibers? in the aorta. Exactly, Marfans. You guys are gonna be able to tie things together from your FTM days. I promise you it's gonna finally start making sense. It's a glorious moment when you realize all of the things that they like kind of built you up for is finally like starting to click. So Marfans here, and then you're gonna see aortic dissections and all of those things kind of brought into play. Now let's do another question. These are the type of questions you'll likely see on the exam. Keep that in mind. And I'll give you guys a little bit more time so you guys can take a peek at all of the histo slide and make up your mind as to which one you want to go for. Cool. I figured I figured the two best answers would, would be narrowed down to A and B, but you guys are, the 55% of y'all are absolutely correct. The answer is A. That's because what we are looking at here is the external carotid artery, right? The external carotid artery is a muscular artery, right? Because remember, we are have moved away from the aorta, right? Your aorta is a classic example of an elastic artery. So I've gone ahead and labeled the other ones here, right? The small artery, large vein, and medium vein, so that you guys can distinguish those and associate each of the potential locations where you're going to find them. Okay, cool. Nicely done. Let's do one. There's a couple of other things that you guys need to keep in mind. Is the internal carotid artery associated with elastic uh, fibers? Okay, so there's a transition point in the internal carotid um, from the aorta, um, or sorry, the common carotid would be more elastic. Um, it's going to, I mean, it's more muscular, I'm going to kind of say, but there's a transition point where it becomes muscular from elastic to muscular. These, they kind of give you like hard and fast definitions for these, but remember most of the things they have a transition point. So that's why the internal carotid Remember, the common carotid gives way to the internal and the external. So common carotid would be more elastic um, and further on transitioning into muscular artery. So just keep that in mind. Good question, Natalie. Now, a couple of things I wanna still cover with the histology components. These, they like to test on because you're gonna, later on, you're gonna cover um, a couple of your uh, immuno stuff um, dealing with specifically like um, fighting back um, infections, um, bacterial issues. So um, 
the PDFs are posted on the Facebook group. Um, just feel free to kind of sign into our DES groups and grab those. What you need to keep in mind for these is that they're dealing with your immune cells and how they can actually get into the blood vessel and start um, fighting off and fending for your life here. So your HAVs are super critical in that front. They basically have this homing effect and the lymphoid structures are lining close to it. Because remember, we are in the endothelial vessels. They, they have that clinical significance. Anything with clinical significance can be tested. Remember, they have a, the loosest junctional complexes. So your big lymphocytes and things can kind of squeeze through. Um, if you guys remember back to FTM, they actually showed you how it kind of does that rolling effect and everything. So make sure you guys go back and review that process of how they enter into your vasculature. A couple of other things, Marfans, we talked about this. Now, this is a tricky question because I remember getting stumbled upon it um, during our exam and when we were doing practice questions. Marfans, it actually, a laceration happens, does it happen in the intima, media, or adventitia? The initial insult. Feel free to tell her. Cool, exactly, intima. So I got tripped up because the picture it shows like it's right between um, the media and the adventitia. So make sure you guys um, remember the initial insult or laceration happens at the intima level and then transitions and cuts through the media and adventitia. Now, the problem is once it starts penetrating through the um, adventitia, you basically have a ruptured aorta. And remember you rupturing an aorta is not good because everything, systemic circulation gets completely messed up, high amounts of bleeding, basically a very poor prognosis. Now, the other thing we got tested on was the varicose veins. It's basically caused by the failure of, um, of, of the valves, right? The valves that are holding the venous returns, right? Remember, blood has to go from your extremities all the way back. So you have basically these one-way um, valves and they're stopping your blood from going back down due to gravity. So when these vessels essentially fail, you then have blood pooling because remember your veins can be distended and that distension is gonna present physiologically um, and pathologically as these varicose veins. Super scary to look at, um, but you'd have to kind of treat for it um, regardless. So there's a couple of other sites that you can find. Um, your lecture has a couple of examples. Um, I just included this because they, it was very, very critical to our CPR um, knowledge of venous return. And trust me, you're gonna learn more about venous return. A little question to kind of give me time to save my voice. Cool. Okay, let's see how we did. Nice. Nicely done. 85% of you, you guys got it. So make sure you guys memorize these numbers. They will save you a bunch of trouble in the future trying to distinguish the various histo slides if you can kind of basically remember the layers. We, we essentially made like a table and we just went through it. Um, there's a couple of like histo slide um, PowerPoints out there. I'll try to post those before your guys' exam so you guys can have like a quick memory recollection of these. So 40 to 70 layers of the circular smooth muscle and elastic laminae. So obviously Marfans, right? What are we likely talking about? We're talking about the aorta. So then it, we're talking about elastic fibers. So there you go, 40 to 70 layers of circular smooth muscle. Cool. Yes. All right, so I'll, I put this here as a little bit of self-study know the difference for the layers, the clinical correlates for each of the things, but I'm gonna kind of do a quick run through of these so that you guys can um, 
hopefully not make the same histo mistakes that we did. So what are, what are we likely looking at here? Feel free to drop it in the chat or shout it out. Elastic artery. Elastic the artery. Aorta. Awesome, in the aorta. What about this one? Muscular artery. Muscular artery, awesome. What about this one? Small artery. Small arteries. And what about this one? Arterial. Arterials. Now, why is arterials important? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Absolutely. Now, this is how you guys should run through histo. Go through all of these once again after, after we're done with this session. Add the clinical correlates because I've given you guys the answers to these. But what you guys need to is right below, just add the clinical correlates for each section. If there's any, if there's not, then that's fine. You just have a quick, you know, histo recollection. Let's do these. What is the first one? The Weibo Pilates bodies or something. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and trust me, I pronounced it the same same way. No worries. Um, it's dealing with uh, the von Willebrand factors and things. You're gonna see those later on when you're gonna learn the clotting factors, um, and the clot a clotting um, kind of stasis of blood that results in clotting. So we'll we'll cover those in a later session with you guys. What about this one? Continuous capillary. Continuous capillaries, awesome. That's, uh, you can call it continuous capillaries, the somatic, there's like all sorts of things. The clinical correlates I left for you guys to add the notes in. I haven't added them in here because that was my little homework assignment for you guys so that you guys can go back and review the slides. What about this one? Fenestrated. Capillary. Fenestrated, nice. So you guys see the little gaps in it and that's how you can identify the little like fenestrations. Um, Let's do this one. What about this one? Discontinuous or sinusoidal. Awesome, exactly. So make sure you guys go back and add like, okay, is it, where am I gonna find this? Is it in the kidneys? Is it gonna be in the heart? Is it gonna be in the, in the muscles or the connective tissues? Just run through these, add the correlates. It's gonna be super beneficial. That's how I learned it. It was, um, it was nice because they asked questions exactly based off of these images. What about these guys? HEV. HEV dealing with what correlate? The post capillary venules. Post capillary venules dealing with your immune functions. What about this one? Medium vein. Medium veins. Okay. Those have like these basically valves, like one-way valves. And when they fail, that becomes the varicose veins that you guys saw before. What about this one? This one's a little tougher to identify. Large veins, awesome. And then finally, we get to a nice clinical correlate. What about this one? Good aneurysm. Yep, aortic aneurysm. And you can basically associate it with Marfan's or a couple of other pathologies that you're gonna learn later on. Cool. Um, here are the answers. Sorry, my scrolling a little too fast. Now let's get to your guys' favorite topic. Since you guys all crushed MSK, we're gonna get into the mediastinum plus anatomy and clinical correlation, correlations. Awesome. Let's start it off with a question because what's better than learning anatomy with questions? Okay, let's see how you guys did. Now, 
this one, I fully expect you guys to be a little thrown off by. So I'm um, happy that you guys remember your anatomy very well. It, oh, that was the next one that I was gonna throw you guys off. So left recurrent laryngeal, that is very, very, trust me, we're learning like left recurrent laryngeal even now. You need to know this innervation very well. Any sort of hoarseness that you see in the question stem likely associated with left recurrent laryngeal, which is a branch off of what structure, guys? What what main nerve? Vegas. Vegas, exactly. Awesome. Um, nicely done. Okay. Whenever you see the left recurrent laryngeal, okay, always associated with the aortic arch. If there's any sort of aortic arch dysfunction or pathology where Sarah is going to cover embryo with you guys, you guys are going to see some kind of hoarseness or pathologies relating to aortic arch and the hoarseness that you're going to see in the question step. So keep that in mind, associate those two also together. Cool. Here's a nice picture. You guys can see, let me get this out of the way, um, recurrent laryngeal. Look at how it kind of loops downward, right? Loops around the aorta and then ascends again. So it's a kind of a funky system, but think about it. Everything's kind of packed in this tight space. So everything kind of loops around each other. So recurrent laryngeal associate here, keep that in mind. These, every single one here is very important. You're gonna cover it in some level, some capacity. I've only highlighted the ones that you guys need to know for now. Um, what do we, oh, next question. We'll kind of do it and then we'll cover the next one. Let's do this question. This is definitely one of the very heavy buzzword, heavy exams. So just make sure you guys associate things together. And trust me, you're gonna do swell. Um, we did great on CPR. It's one of our favorite exams. Exactly. So we were a little split on this. Here we are looking at the phrenic, right? Now, whenever you think of the phrenic, right, always associated with referred pain, and that's what's being associated here, association with pain over the left shoulder. Now, this is different than what we learned for typical like cardiac anomalies. Remember, this is dealing with what structure if it's the phrenic. What does phrenic innervate? The diaphragm. Diaphragm, awesome. So keep that in mind. Any sort of diaphragmatic changes, um, it's gonna be associated with uh, phrenic pain. And phrenic, oops, let me get this graph out of the way. You can see how phrenic basically runs downward and then innervates the entire diaphragm. So that is gonna be then referred to on a dermatome level to the shoulder. So that's how you can kind of break that apart. And they can even ask you questions about like, you know, your dermatome levels yet again, what dermatome layer is it gonna be found with this pain? So um, make sure you guys go ahead and review that as well. So you can see how nicely the phrenic kind of branches in. So enters through the superior medius sinus between the subclavian artery and the root of the brachiocephalic vein, um, and it courses the entire length of the, uh, of the of the pericardium, right? And we're gonna get to the layers of the heart. So make sure you guys remember phrenic with the pericardium too, because it's very important. Sensory and motor innervation to the diaphragm, right? If you have any sort of insult or changes to one side of the diaphragm versus the other, you can basically pinpoint what nerve or vasculature is messed up at that point. So keep that in mind. Let's do another question. And I'm gonna make a nice throwback to uh, your days of MSK with this question. Exactly, three, four, five for the phrenic.
Awesome. For those who are joining us a little bit later, session ID is here. So I'm gonna just leave it in this corner. Hopefully it's not in the way of anything. Awesome. Looks like you guys remember your wonderful mnemonics from MSK. It's absolutely and 100% true. The herniation of the esophagus through the hiatus at T10. So what's the mnemonic that I keep referring to so passionately? That I one. ate 10 eggs at 12. Exactly. I ate 10 eggs at 12. So inferior vena cava, T8, esophagus, T10, aorta, T12. They honestly gave us a lot of the, like these kind of cumulative questions from MSK as well as um, CPR. So make sure you guys know it well. Um, here for completion's sake, I added for the details from the diaphragm. So just for your own edification here, just I've associated those with the each mnemonic. So nice. Let's, oh, okay. The mediastinum questions that you're gonna get are very, very, focused on like regionally what it's divided to. I think they did a poor job of kind of explaining it. So I'm gonna just stick to what I've learned from the past. They really like the thymus level questions. So learn the thymus very well, the esophagus of the superior mediastinum. Um, likely some of the arches of the aorta can be tested. Um, innervation for sure, they love. Most of the questions you're gonna likely get are from the superior mediastinum. Very little is really emphasized on the anterior and the middle uh, mediastinum. If anything, you, you're gonna see a couple of questions on these because of likely like blunt force trauma for to the anterior mediastinum and they're gonna associate with like the middle mediastinum with what portion of the heart is located at one side. So just be aware of those. Posterior, we didn't really get too much other than um, the azygous vein and the hemiazygous. That was because of a cumulative MSK level question. So um, yeah, not too many crazy things running through this um, to just keep that in mind. You guys don't need to go too crazy with that. Um, but what you do need to know is cardiac anatomy very well. It is the foundation's bread and butter of this entire module. So you've got to know it very well. So let's start off with a question. Make sure you guys read the question very carefully here. Okay, I figured that this one is gonna cause you guys to split your hairs. So the answer here is actually C. So we're looking at where the lead actually terminates and that is the anterior portion of your heart and likely associated with the anterior portion, right? Where it's running through from here all the way and you're gonna have to look at this little thing at this corner. Likely the left ventricle is over here because remember the heart is slightly turned. So it's not most of what's present in the front is going to be the right ventricle. So whenever you have any sort of insult to the front of the heart or like front of your rib cage, it's always gonna mess up your right ventricle if it's deep enough or if it's a big enough oomph to your um, rib cage. So right ventricle here, it is not the left ventricle. Left ventricle is more tucked away at this corner. So it's slightly deviated away and it's mostly dealing with systemic circulation. What likely could be messed up here is gonna be more the pulmonic circulation. So just keep that in mind. Think higher order for these level of questions. Cool. Now let's do a little bit of an exercise here of the layers of the pericardium. What's two guys? Fibrous pericardium. Fibrous. Awesome. Fibrous, what's three? The parietal layer of 
the serous pericardium? Yeah, the serous pericardium. I'm just going to associate it with a serous so that you guys don't have to get too deep with this. Um, then you get into the space in between. What is that space? Pericardial cavity. Awesome, pericardial cavity. And then finally, what's the fifth layer? The visceral layer. Yeah, visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Awesome. Now, remember, this is super critical, right? These layers are going to give you a whole bunch of clinical correlates. The first thing you need to kind of think of, um, sorry, uh, we, Sarah was saying something in the chat, um, but feel free to read that um, for your own education. What fluid can collect and cause a tamponade? Where can the fluid collect and cause a tamponade, guys? What pericardial cavity. cavity. Pericardial cavity. And what, what is the triad associated with that? Next triad. Next triad, exactly. That's what I was looking for. Nicely done. Know these very well, okay? If you put a stethoscope to the patient's chest, if they have any sort of cardiac tamponade, you're going to basically hear any one of these things. I mean, even if you take their blood pressure, you'll see the hypotension. Distant heart sounds because there's a whole bunch of liquid that or liquid or blood that's filling this cavity and then distended neck veins because you're going to see the heart is working extra hard. Um, exactly. Keep an eye on the chat. We're dropping in a lot of important details. Cool. Let's do a question. You're doing so good. I remember it being so lost in CPR1 in the beginning, and it finally started clicking at the tail end. Okay, let's see how we did. So it's between the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium. Nicely done. You guys killed it, paid attention. I love it. So just keep that in mind. Know these layers very well. This is how they like to test. They potentially can even give you a lineup all of all the different like layers and tell you like which um, layer has serious secretions and they can kind of like give you the whole rundown of that way. So make sure you guys review these very well. Okay. Let's do, oh, here, more details of this. Um, my apologies, I could have gone over this later. Um, cardiac tamponade, right? It's some kind of insult or injury or um, gunshot wound that's like close enough that it penetrates through and starts gushing blood into the pericardial um, cavity. Everything that I've talked about here can be kind of explained based off of like the functions. Fluid collection, pericardium located between the visceral and parietal layer. Now, remember the pain could likely cause a change to the diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is integrated by what? The phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve. What is the le spinal levels C3, associated with? C3, C4, C5. Exactly. So keep that in mind. If it gets big enough, the layers, right, it's, uh, or sorry, if the cardiac tamponade gets big enough and start messing around with the functions of your lungs, which then will result in C3, C4, C5, they can ask questions like that. So keep that um, diaphragm alive. Okay. So clinical notes. So inflammation of the pericardium, you can have pericarditis, right? That's straight up caused by couple of different insults. It could be renal failure, myocardial infarction, post-surgery complications, as well as infection. Certain bacteria, we're going to learn in term, um, you're going to learn in term three, actually covers a lot of these um, areas. So this can cause changes in the serous secretions in this area. Um, they will not have a test on the causes. Keep that in mind. They won't, they won't have an exact test. They'll give you likely the, for, sorry, let me kind of give clarity. Bex triad for cardiac tamponade, they're not gonna give you a, a question on the causes of it. Likely they're gonna give you causes um, 
for any sort of like, it's gonna be put into the clinical vignette. So keep that in mind. Um, what you do need to keep in mind is this part, the pericardial frictional rub. It's because of the fact that you're changing in the composition of the serous secretions from the serous layer of the pericardium, resulting in um, not having the sufficient secretions or like messing up the concentrations of it, which then can cause this rubbing of the layers, which is bad because think about it, your heart is moving this cavity. So it's, it's gonna cause increased kind of sounds that you can hear with the stethoscope. Um, pericardial effusion, accumulation of fluid. When they say effusion, it's not talking about um, likely blood. Remember, that's different than um, cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade associate more with blood, whereas um, pericardial effusion is likely dealing with some other thing, such as um, you know uh, lymphatic uh, fluids or et cetera. So causes pericarditis, connective tissue diseases, as well as um, hypothyroidism. All those things you're going to learn more in the clinical year. So don't, don't trip about those too much. Just know the terms pericarditis, pericardial effusions, and like what the likely issue is going to be. So you're going to see a widening silhouette. So if you guys ever have your radiographs on hand, there's like a diagram or like a couple of PowerPoints that are floating around. I'll post those later where you guys can review those uh, radiograph images. Cool. Let's do a imaging question because they love their imaging. Also, sorry if I'm talking real fast. A um, lot of this material, I'm hoping to kind of cover with you guys very quickly because this is um, all clinical correlates and I want, want to make sure if you guys have any deficiencies that you guys go back and review these because these are tested heavily. Awesome, so we were split on this. The answer here is D. I know you guys were definitely tripped up by this. I was initially, what is the imaging modality that we're seeing here, guys? CT. CT. Nice. Exactly. So this is a CT. Um, so the answer here is D, right? Because what we were actually looking for here is right there. So what is what is that? What is that structure called? Isn't that the esophagus? That is not the esophagus. Yes. Well, I mean, the esophagus is right here, and that's, an, I think, the black. But D here is the aortical pulmonary window, right? That's where the left recurrent laryngeal basically extends beneath the aortic arch and causing, like, pulmonary, like, trunk issues as well as common site for compression. So if you have left recurrent laryngeal also running through this kind of curvature, um, what would likely be messed up? What, what's the presentation? Coarseness, Would it be guys. coarseness? Exactly, coarseness. Awesome. Let's really do quick, um... sorry, Can we just go back to that one really quickly? So yeah. I know that imaging is kind of an issue for a lot of people because we don't really spend too much time learning it. But for this question, if you see ascending aorta and descending aorta in the same image, you know that that aortic arch has to be somewhere close to it. So that's how you can narrow it down to, okay, if I'm pointing to the spot between the ascending and the descending aorta, what do I know can cause a clinical correlation or some sort of, sort of pathology in that region? And that's how you want to kind of approach all of these questions when it comes to imaging, because they're going to ask you something that's not really just related to the imaging. So if you know the anatomy and you can differentiate what's going on in the imaging, then you should be fine for these questions. Definitely make sure you guys review all of your clinical correlates and associate them with the imaging. Otherwise it's, it's tough 
for for just pure imaging to kind of get you there. It's like halfway. It's like halfway you're there, but like you need to know the clinical correlates. So make sure you guys review those. I think we'll post a document on that later. Cool. Let's do this question. Don't worry, the murmurs and stuff, you're gonna get to later. I promise you it's gonna be okay. Okay, let's see how we did. So the answer here is actually left atrium. And I believe one of us actually posted it in the chat that this is this tends to be a very common presentation. So the left atrium is located and situated very close, right, structurally to uh, the esophagus. So let me guys show you guys the picture of uh, the structures so that you guys can see it. So esophagus, like Armand said, it, it tends to be mostly flattened. Um, and when you have any sort of like food or any foreign objects kind of going through, it can actually go through this area, right? The esophagus, and if it's pretty bad, like let's say a kid swallowed a really bad Lego or something, like very sharp or whatever, or maybe something even more dangerous. Um, and he basically, um, it, it's stuck here because this is one of the areas where actually your kind of esophagus narrows and we're gonna cover more about that later, but the left atrium can be penetrated through from the esophagus. You can see there's only like very thin covering between those two. Because remember all of the structures running through this area, there's not, it's all compressed. Your lungs are here on the two sides as well as like the arteries running. Um, so just keep that in mind. This tends to be a common thing, okay? Let's do another question. Also make sure you guys know these radiographs um, and identify how you can tell whether you're looking at an anterior axis view or a posterior axis view. Um, they, they, they can trip up a lot of folks just based off of that. But this should be nice and straightforward. Okay, let's see how we're doing. So the answer here is the aortic arch. Um, I know you guys were slightly tripped up by the left main bronchus. Here, trust me, the bronchus component wouldn't, wouldn't you know, really quickly give it away because the bronchus are basically coming here, right? You'll see like kind of a very, you know, poor outlining, but the arch, right? The aortic arch tends to be very dominant, right? Um, how can you tell the difference from an AP versus PA view? The shoulder blades, okay? Um, that was the thing that like tripped up a lot of folks, but let me finish explaining this and I'll show you guys the trick with the shoulder blades, okay? Now, this is the aortic arch. So you can see this is the cardiac silhouette right here. And from here, you can see the um, aorta basically ascending, and then it's going to start descending. The aorta is such a big structure. So it's... It, basically takes over most of what you're seeing here and you can see it kind of run down this way too. So that was the aortic arch. So how can you tell the difference between an AP versus PA view? So in an AP view, right, you're gonna um, see the shoulder blades basically sticking out on the sides, right? Versus the PA view, right? The posterior view, you're gonna see um, where did I get that swapped? Um, Sarah, can you? I think they learned that in CPR too because we learned it with lung stuff when oh. we learned all of the lung pathology. So I don't think you guys need to know that at this point. 
because it would only be more confusing. You don't really need to know anything. Yeah. That. Erase everything I said. Trust me, we'll cover it in CPR too. I don't want to give you guys a heart attack right now. So thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Um, now, let's move actually into cardiac anatomy. Um, thank you guys for your patience. We learned a lot of these things together. We like started clubbing a lot of these things together. So um, thank you guys for bearing with my antics. Um, now, you guys need to know these valves very well, okay? They love their questions on the tricuspid versus mitral versus your aortic versus your pulmonic. Now, the way I remember it, right? your right heart from your left heart and the valves and things running through it, you have a right to try something before you buy, right? So tricuspid is located on what side? The right side and bicuspid on the left. Exactly. So that's how I remember it. Tricuspid versus bicuspid, right? You have a right to try. So right being right side um, and then bi is going to be dealing with the left side, which is the mitral valve. Cool. Um, these valves are going to be tested heavily, so just know them very well, as well as the sounds associated with them. So what is the first heart sound you would hear with um, the mitral and the tricuspid shutting down or closing? S1. S1 or LUB, exactly. Um, what about S2? What sound would you hear? What valves are associated with that? Semilunar valve. Awesome. Semilunar valve. Um, or, or they can call it pulmonary, or um, they can call it aortic. Cool. Awesome. Let us also go through a couple of other things. Um, now, you guys definitely need to know your chorded tendinase, okay? So the chorded tendinase are going to be associated with your bicuspid and tricuspid. So if one vessel, or sorry, one valve is called bicuspid, how many chorded tendinase would we likely have? Two. So, and if you have three, right, for like for your valves, um, how many would you think you would have on that side? Three. Three. It's as simple as that. These chordae tendinase essentially serve like a parachuting function, right? When you're going through this, um, blood is, is basically going to be contracted out and it's going to figure out any orifice or any kind of cavity that it can kind of run through. So if this, these chordae tendinase aren't, playing a role in keeping the valves closed and not allowing for them to kind of um, handle the pressure, then you can have a valve failure. So keep those in mind and associate them with any sort of like valve level failure too. So if you see kind of ballooning and all those things, Sarah will go into those physiologies too. So um, keep that in mind. Let us kind of go into the coronary arteries. Now the coronary arteries, right? Coronary means crown, right, in Latin and Greek. So it's just basically these are the crowning arteries that gives blood supply to the heart. Remember, if the heart is pumping out blood to the rest of the system um, into both systemic and pulmonic circulation, it needs to also get a tap of that exact same blood, right? It needs oxygenated blood and it needs to also pull out any deoxygenated blood from the tissue that keeps the heart going. So it has its own set of blood vessels. So what you need to know is that certain people are right dominant versus certain people are left dominant. Your right dominant versus left dominant. What is the difference, guys? PDA, someone P said PDA. Yes, PDA is important. But remember the dominance and the emergence of these actual vessels from the aorta is what dictates whether you're right dominant versus left dominant, right? That's like the main concept. They don't get too fancy smancy with those. There are a couple of question stems. They might throw in a left, left sided person um, versus a right sided person, but that's it. What you guys need to know are each of the potential emerging ones coming off of the main vessels. Now you have two main vessels that emerge for you know, art arterial blood supply, the RCA versus LCA, right? Your RCA for most right dominant folks is going to give way to several things, right? What is it going to give way? What's the important thing that you guys learned? Posterior descending artery. Posterior descending artery. Now they love the posterior descending artery because um, it's one of the main branches. They don't get too crazy with any of the minor branches like the obtuse, 
versus, um, you know, like the acute marginal. So the obtuse and acute marginal, they don't really don't spend too much time, but they do like the left circumferential arteries and they also love their LADs. Why is LAD of clinical significance? That's the widow maker. Widow maker. Okay, nicely done. Here is just a summary that I kind of, you know, wanted to kind of cover with you guys. RCA arises from the right aortic sinus via the ascending aorta and the territories that it basically covers is the right atrium, SA and AV nodes. So they can ask you questions stems as simple as, okay, like you notice like um, a vascular event to the SA and AV nodes and the atrium. What is likely the cause of it? You can be like as simple as RCA, right? That's like a second, third order question that you can kind of answer there. Um, and they love their questions with their PDAs. I don't know why, but it just tends to be a thing that just drives them happy. Um, right AMA, right? Um, acute marginal, it basically courses along the diaphragmatic border, right? And it's not, it's not too crazy, but it gives blood supply to the right ventricle, right? If it's the right ventricle, what are we likely looking at? If, if you have an acute AMA failure, right? What's, what's gonna be messed up? Systemic circulation or pulmonic circulation? Pulmonic. Pulmonic, okay. That's how they like to go through these. So just keep that in mind. These are like nicely labeled. Feel free to go look at AMBOSS. They have even more details on these. Um, let's look at the left side. So um, your, your couple of things that you need to know, I mean, we're still kind of on the right side, but PDA, it descends right and left to the ventricles on the posterior surface of the heart towards the apex. So it just runs through and hits the apex close to here. Territory, it's the posterior one third of the interventricular septum. Remember, septums are always important in any sort of medical kind of context and clinical significance. Posterior inferior aspect of the heart, as well as the posterior medial papillary muscles. Now, the papillary muscles are attached to what structure in general? It's going to be the chordae tendinae, right? They yeah. They attach to the chordae tendinae and they're involved in keeping the blood, like, you know, the valves from either ballooning out or failing completely. So um, keep those in mind. So that, that's why PDA becomes a very good um, clinical significant here. Let's look at the LCA um, left coronary artery, right? It's coming from the left aortic sinus, right? It comes from the right aortic sinus. So just keep that in mind, LAD, right? Why is LAD bad? Like what Widowmaker you guys said, but tell me the clinical significance of what it supplies. Well, it's associated with coronary artery disease just because the way it wraps around, it's usually more likely to get clogged. Exactly. And there's not too many anastomosing blood supply with the coronary arteries. So um, LED tends to be the one that messes up the left ventricle and left ventricle likely deals with what type of uh, circulation, systemic or pulmonic? Systemic. 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 This is how you guys run through it. Um, make sure you guys know your LCX too. Less tested on um, left uh, circumferential artery. Um, what you need to know is that it essentially courses through the coronary sulcus towards the posterior aspect and gives rise potentially to the PDA for the left dominant folks. That's the only way they can really test the left circumflex artery. There's not too many crazy things with it. So just keep that in mind um, for the left dominant folks, PDA, LCX, okay? Okay, that's all of the arteries. Now we'll get into the veins in a bit. Um, so I just threw up a question here for you guys to quickly see what your knowledge is of the veins. You don't really spend too much time with the veins, but um, I think it's still important, certain ones. Oh yes. Um, the systemic is associated with the left ventricle, whereas the right is associated with the pulmonic. And the vessels that are associated with it are, are on the slides. I'll, I'll go back. I can go back um, or you guys can review it. It's posted on the Facebook group. Okay. So you guys are absolutely correct. Um, 
the great cardiac is really, they love great cardiac. I don't know why, but it just tends to be that way. Sorry for the aggressive scrolling. They love the great cardiac vein as well as the middle cardiac vein. If you know these two, you're pretty much set. Everything else is kind of superfluous. The main branches that gives off is the coronary kind of sinus from the great cardiac. So just know those two and you should be good. And I put the, these two images side by side so that you guys can run through them in parallel for the questions that allow you to kind of like think what artery is running in kind of in parallel with this vein. So just keep that in mind. Cool. Now auscultation, you're gonna get more into and Sarah's gonna cover it again, but um, the way we kind of remember it um, is AP, TM. The first aid book says apartment M, but I like to think of it as um, <laughs> um, all physicians um, take, take, money. Money. take money. Take money. I was going to say take, I was like, try money. And I was like, take money. Yeah. So take money. There's a couple of other ones that are even, even worse um, in terms of like their mnemonics. You guys can feel free to throw those into the chat, but you guys definitely need to know these and they will be tested on OSCEs. So know them now and they will come back over and over again. They will ask you to learn them based off of the murmurs and the heart sounds. So first one we need to know is that the aortic valve is located um, second right intercostal space along the parasternal line. So basically anything happens at this point with the aortic valve, like aortic stenosis or et cetera, um, <laughs> That's the one I was talking about. I didn't want to say that one. Um, <laughs> um, it's associated with like kind of a radiating issue to the um, carotids, which is, you know, here. Um, then you have your pulmonic. That's on the left-hand side. So if you have any pulmonic level stenosis or regurgitation, you're going to see that with the second left intercostal space along the parasternal line. Make sure you guys know the parasternal versus um, midclavicular. They love to give questions about those and they can literally say the exact same thing, except they could swap it with um, midclavicular versus parasternal. So um, you guys can run through all of those. Oh yeah, parasternal. Okay, whenever you think of parasternal, always think of the sternum. So running in pair with it is parasternal. So this is like parasternal, parasternal space, parasternal space. So they like to test those out. So these are your parasternal one, two, and three are your parasternal spaces. And the mid clavicular line is right here. So mid clavicle, so you'd run through the clavicle. I mean, if you're doing this on a patient, you could just basically palpate the clavicle and just like go in all the way down until you get to the um, fourth space right here, which is actually located at the fifth um, intercostal space, okay, mid clavicular line. Yeah, they could call it costal border, but they tend to keep the definitions very um, kind of sane with these parasternal. If you guys saw your lectures, so um, they tend to say parasternal. They don't get too crazy with the costal borders. Okay, but yes, costal borders would work too. Costal borders are talking about the costal as in ribs, so the don't don't associate it directly with the parasternal. Okay, let's do this one. I am. Hopefully keeping this. Okay, so the answer is aorta. So nicely done, guys. Um, that was a quick way to identify it. What chamber receives blood that's being ejected through the narrow opening? It's aorta. Okay, nicely done. Straight up anatomical references. Let's do this one.
Okay, let us go over this. So this is absolutely intercostal brachial. Now, this is very common. If you guys ever see a question stem and they say pain rating out to his arms, arm associate with intercostal, okay? If you see any sort of like diaphragmatic pain, then it's going to be like radiating to the shoulder blade, okay? Straight up from lecture, learn this very well. Um, they do like the dermatomes, so know the T2, T3, T4, and the T1s likely are the causes of this kind of pain. So um, nicely done. And here, I just put this in for your own information. All you need to know is that uh, Vegas is de dealing with parasympathetics and your, um, your, your sympathetic chains are gonna be dealing with typically stuff innervating your ventricles, whereas the parasympathetic is gonna be dealing with the, your um, atriums. So that's basically it for me. We're gonna move into cardiac physiology and Sarah's gonna take over. Okay, real quick before we start, do you guys need like a five minute break or do you want to just push through it? How are we feeling right now? We have a break, please. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I know it's really heavy, like the intro lecture, so go ahead. Uh, we'll start in about five minutes, so you guys can take a break. So we're having something isovolumetric. So this is going to be your isovolumetric contraction. No volume change. All the valves are closed. So when your valves are all closed, you have this closed box and you have blood inside, nothing's moving in or out, but your pressure is going to increase. So you see this very rapid increase in pressure and that's how you end up getting to your number two spot right here. So your number two spot is gonna be, once that pressure gets high enough, your aortic valve is gonna open and then you're gonna get ejection. So all that blood that was in that left ventricle, now you've built up a whole bunch of pressure to overcome the aortic pressure. And then all that blood's gonna move from high pressure to low pressure. So then you would have the ejection phase. Once you get to that point three, that's where your aortic valve is gonna close. So if you think about it, it logically happens. Something opens, it has to close before something else opens. So it'll make a lot of sense if you go through it that way. Number three, your aortic valve is gonna close. That means that you've ejected all of your blood and now your ventricle is slightly empty. It's not ever going to be completely empty. That's something that you guys should always keep in mind. So for number three, you closed all your valves. So now you're getting isovolumetric something. And because there's no pressure being built up, it's only decreasing pressure. So this is your isovolumetric relaxation. Once you get to 0.4 here, that means that your ventricle is completely relaxed. Your heart is somewhat empty on the left, in the left ventricle. So then your mitral valve is going to open and then you're going to begin filling again. So you're trying to get ready for that next contraction where you're ejecting blood. So this is how I kind of went over all of these graphs and diagrams. There's a lot of graphs coming at you guys. So just if you take it apart piece by piece and try to understand each part of it, it kind of becomes more intuitive than just memorizing a bunch of graphs. Okay. For the volumes, you wanna always associate the volumes with the pressures. So we were talking about the pressures. When your mitral valve is closed, you're over here at your number one spot. So we said isovolumetric contraction. If you ever see isovolumetric, don't even bother trying to figure out what's happening to the volume, nothing's happening to it. So move on. Number two is when your aortic valve is gonna open. Aortic valve opening means blood is moving somewhere. So blood is going from your left ventricle into your aorta. And so you have your ejection phase. Your ejection phase is split into two phases. You just want to know that you have a rapid and you have a reduced ejection phase. So one third of the time you have this like insanely steep, so much blood is being ejected. And then for the rest of the time, it's like whatever's left over is kind of making its way out. For this, you want to know that your stroke volume is going to be represented by this because Kishore said earlier, stroke volume is going to be the amount of blood that you're pumping out per heartbeat, right? So because you know that, when are we pumping blood out into systemic circulation? 
when it's in the left ventricle and the aortic valve opens. So this is your stroke volume, your ejection phase. When the aortic valve closes, all of them are closed. We're in isovolumetric, it doesn't even matter. And so the volume's not changing. For number four, that's when you have your mitral valve opening again. And because we already ejected, that means we have to fill before we can eject again. So now we're just filling your left ventricle. All of the blood that's in that right, uh, that left atrium is falling into it because we opened the valve that separates the two chambers. Okay. You guys will have a lot more time with this. I'm just trying to explain it in the way that I understood it. I hope it helps you guys. <laughs> Um, for the electrocardiogram, like I said, you guys are going to have like two lectures on this, maybe more. You're going to have a small group on this. So at this point, you want to know what it, each of these represents. So the P wave is going to be when that SA node gets that action potential, it starts some sort of electrical cascade. So that's your P wave. It's going to be atrial depolarization. Your QRS complex, we refer to it usually as one thing. So QRS complex is going to be your ventricular depolarization. And then your T wave is going to be your ventricular repolarization. So you just want to know that at this point, and then it'll get more detailed. Okay. This was a really good summary sheet. It's in first aid. Um, I used first aid for CPR one more than I've ever used first aid. It is amazing for it. Please use it. Annotate it during office hours. Use it. For this graph, we have this thing called the jugular venous pulse. I don't remember if we were tested on it. I do remember getting practice questions on it. So if anything, just know what these letters stand for. Um, and then, so this is just another way to view it. I would recommend going through this, making sure you understand each of the phases. Let's go to the next slide. All right, let's do a question. Sorry, for the person that asked, the ejection phase is when blood is moving from your left ventricle into your systemic circulation, so into your aorta. You're ejecting the blood from the heart, moving it out into the circulation. Okay, little split, but so for this one, we are talking about the stroke volume. When we're looking at stroke volume, that means that we want to know your end diastolic volume minus your end systolic volume. This point here is going to be, that was a lot bigger than I expected it to be. <laughs> this is going to be your end diastolic volume. And then this is going to be your end systolic volume. They're usually going to be represented at the bottom of these graphs right here. So you just want to know that this value is going to correspond to your end diastolic minus your end systolic. So because we know that this is your ejection phase, this is the amount of blood that is being ejected from the left ventricle and moving into the aorta. Okay, mm, clear. All right, let's move on. And that brings us to the pressure volume loop. This is going to be very related to the Wiggers diagram. So we are just adding a little bit more, a couple more values to it. So like I said, your EDV, is going to be right here. Your ESV is going to be right here. So literally they're just asking you to subtract, but in order to do that, you need to know what the formula is. So these formulas are super important. Practice with them, do all of the Guyton Hall questions that they suggest that you do. Um, so if you go to Toledo's office hours, he will make you sing and dance this. I won't do that to you guys this time because I know this is a long weekend and you guys are sacrificing time to be here. So I won't embarrass you guys, but 
just try to correspond this to what we went over in the pressures and the volumes. I went over those two in detail so that it'll be easier for you guys to interpret this graph when you look at it. Okay, no way. I'm kind of jealous that you guys had Toledo. Let's <laughs> move on to the next slide. Okay, understanding the definition between turbulent and laminar flow is really important when you're talking about stenosis, when you're talking about atherosclerosis, Anything that is obstructing the flow of blood through your blood vessels is going to cause turbulent um, turbulent flow. So it's going to creep up to that obstruction and then the blood is going to move from an area of super high pressure to an area that is very open and low pressure. So then the blood, once it gets to that other side, is just going to be bouncing off the walls and then you get this turbulent flow. And that turbulent flow is going to be related to a lot of your murmurs and heart sounds that are not normal S1, S2 heart sounds. So I just wanna make sure you guys understood that definition. Let's move on. And then this, so I wouldn't worry too much about this formula right now, just because it should be coming back when you do the systemic circulation physiology. So just kind of look over this, make sure you understand the definition of turbulent flow and what it could cause. So ejection murmurs, carotid uh, bruits and stuff. And you'll go over this a lot in the next couple of weeks. Next. Let's do another question. And also, um, you would hear turbulent flow when you're doing like uh, your blood pressure cuff. Like that's one of the kind of critical functions when you when you you hear the first initial spurts of blood. That's like the eddies flow that they kind of mentioned there. So there's something that came to me when I when we were kind of going through the slides. Increasing the diameter increases turbulence. It would if it's pathological, but if you're increasing the diameter everywhere, I don't think so. I'm not 100% sure, but I'll check on that for you. I was just going off of the, uh, the, um, the definition of turbulence and the equation for it. It's something I asked last night in Neil's office hours, but I didn't get a clear answer on it. Yeah, I think it's because it's like circumstantial. So if I have like an atherosclerotic plaque that's obstructing, then before it's not going to be di um, dilated, but because it has to go through a narrowing and then go into the regular blood vessel size, that's when you see like a drastic change from very small diameter to big diameter. And that's what causes the turbulence. If it's like a gradual thing or if I'm like constricting all my blood vessels I'm or dilating all my blood vessels I'm not going to see like turbulent flow if that makes sense so it's that change in diameter yeah exactly okay, thank you no problem okay perfect so knowing your heart sounds also needs to be associated with what valves are closing so when we're talking about your s1 your your lub why did I just do that sorry <laughs> forgot I had the marker on okay so if we're talking about your S1 sound or your lub, that's your first heart sound, and that's gonna be the closure of the mitral and the tricuspid valves. When we're talking about your S2 sound, that's the closure of your pulmonary and aortic valves. And you just wanna remember that these are associated with these specific heart sounds. Okay. Heart sounds, okay. S1 and S2 are normal or pathological. S1 and S2 is normal. Normal. S3, normal or pathological? Both. Normal in kids, but normal in adults. Exactly. And pregnant women, of course. Pregnant women, yes. You guys clearly went to office hours. I'm proud. So S3. S3 is normal in younger patients and pregnant women. So Dr. Toledo said 40 because 40 is still young. So we are going with 35 to 40. That's the range where S3 up until that point, normal. After that point, possibly pathological. S4, is that normal or pathological? Pathological. Always pathological. Okay, great. Just wanna make sure you guys got that down. Okay, 
splitting patterns. You want to know these based on what is closing and what time frame is between the two closures. So aortic and pulmonary valves for normal, they're not closing at exactly the same time. But what you do want to know is that when you inhale or inspire, it's going to separate the two closures. So you're going to have more of a gap between the closure of aortic and closure of the pulmonary valve. When it comes to the widened split, the flat, uh, fixed splitting and the paradoxical splitting, you just want to be able to say, okay, I know with paradoxical, that's the one where I have my pulmonary closing and then my aortic, and that's going to be associated with aortic stenosis, left bundle branch block. You're going to go through all of these pathologies multiple times. So I wouldn't worry too much. Just try to like associate them with which splitting pattern it is. Okay, murmurs. This is going to be like half of what you're talking about for the next how many weeks? I don't know until you take your exam. Murmurs are super important. You need to know which murmur goes with 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 which uh, pathology. So aortic stenosis, we want to associate it with your crescendo decrescendo. So I took these images out of first aid on the left hand side here. Make sure you kind of understand what they mean. Crescendo, decrescendo means it's going up, it's going down. Like it's not going to be the same throughout. Your holosystolic is going to be associated with your mitral regurgitation. This is your buzzword. So holosystolic and mitral regurg. Blowing murmur, high-pitched blowing murmur. Those are the things you want to associate. For our mitral valve prolapse, you're going to have late systolic crescendo murmur. And as shown here, it's starting late into systole. So it's not extending from S1 to S2. For your ventricular septal defect, that's gonna be holosystolic, harsh sounding murmur, and it's loudest at the tricuspid area. So in order to differentiate between mitral regurgitation and ventricular septal defect, we wanna auscultate specifically the tricuspid area, because if it is loudest at the tricuspid area, we're looking more towards our ventricular septal defect as opposed to our mitral regurge. Mitral regurge is gonna be loudest at the apex. Super important to remember that. Let's go to the next one. And you also wanna associate the different pathologies. So Marfan, Ehlers-Danlos, you wanna associate with mitral valve prolapse, rheumatic fever. You wanna associate with both of the regurges and you're gonna go through that more detailed in small group because we're gonna talk about how rheumatic fever actually messes with the valve. So then it's not as stable and you get regurgitation through that valve. Okay. Sarah, quick question. So with the tricuspid regurgitation and then the ventricular one from the previous slide, so mm -hmm. should our buzzword be differentiating between high pitch versus harsh sounding? Because they're both at the, okay. And yeah. it will specifically say that in the questions then, okay. So with your tricuspid and your mitral regurge, they're gonna sound very similar because like we're talking about like the same sort of level of valve, but like two different locations, right? So you're gonna expect the same kind of pathology. With your blowing murmurs, the only way to differentiate between mitral and tricuspid regurge is the location that you're auscultating. But when it comes to tricuspid versus ventral septal def ventricular septal defects, that's gonna be high, uh, high pitched versus harsh sounding. So just like try to figure out what's the difference, associate it with that difference. Okay, your diastolic murmurs, so aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. You guys are gonna go into so much more detail on these, but just knowing the murmurs is important. So with your aortic regurgitation, it's your high pitched blowing, sound and we want to remember that it's early diastolic decrescendo so we know that systolic is going to be sorry let me just turn on this marker thing okay so systolic we said all of the systolic ones were within this range between s1 and s2 so now we're talking about diastolics we expect them all to be after this s2 so associate them with that it'll also help you differentiate what's diastolic what's systolic and then with your patent ductus arteriosus, this one is 
related to your embryo. It's going to be related to your heart sounds. It's going to be related to everything. So just really memorize this one. And it has its own little buzzword. So it's great. Machine-like murmur. You're going to hear machine-like murmur a million times. So make sure that you associate that. With your causes, congenital rubella is going to be a buzzword for your PDA. So make sure that you guys are associating those two. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about our auscultations. Now we're going to talk about what pathologies you would hear at these auscultation points. So in your aortic area or at your second intercostal space on the right, that's where you're going to hear a systolic murmur for a aortic stenosis, um, flow murmur we don't really talk about as much, and then aortic valve sclerosis we don't really talk about as much. So aortic stenosis is what you want to associate with your aortic valve, and that makes sense. So with your pulmonic valve, that's going to be your systolic ejection murmur, and that's pulmonic stenosis, atrial septal defects, and then flow murmur, which I think is associated with almost everything, so you can ignore that one. Tricuspid is your holosystolic murmur for tricuspid regurg and VSD. And then diastolic murmur is tricuspid stenosis. So you have a good number of clinical correlates associated with your tricuspid and your mitral. So you want to be able to differentiate between all of these. And then mitral is going to be around the apex area. Your holosystolic is your mitral regurg and your systolic murmur is going to be mitral valve prolapse. And then diastolic murmur is your mitral stenosis. So just make sure that you guys are associating everything as much as you can. Next slide. Embryo. Okay, so I did put on my post that it, embryo is gonna be super important for this. I know it kind of sucks because this first lecture where they explain the development of the heart itself is kind of crappy, but this is the most important part of it. Literally just go through this slide in first aid or this page in first aid, read it over and it makes so much more sense than trying to put it together with the lecture notes because I know that that's really difficult. Um, with your clinical correlates, there is your patent foramen oval, which is something that you want to remember. So pretty much what's happening is you have these two connected atria in during your fetal life. And as time goes on, you're trying to close this defect and your deadline is birth because by the time the baby is born or the fetus is born, you want to be able to use a heart as a normal heart. It's not going to be having blood go back and forth between the atria and stuff like that. So as time goes on during development, you're supposed to try and close this gap. A lot of times it doesn't completely close or different things can go wrong with it. And that's where all the clinical correlates come in with your embryo lectures so let's see the next slide oh this one too okay this one you want to just kind of understand what aortic arch derivative is coming from what number arch and i think the next slide does a better job of showing it this is just kind of like summary okay so your aortic arch from your first one, you're getting your maxillary artery. I don't think they asked about this one because we're learning this now. So <laughs> I would kind of just remember that, but it's not that important. Um, the ones that are pretty important is anywhere you see aorta, aortic arch, internal carotid is not even that important. Subclavian is important, pulmonary arteries, anything that's directly relating to what we're learning now is what you're going to try and focus on. Let's go to the next slide. And then this has like more detail on some of those arteries. So I would say take a really good look at this slide because you want to know what comes from the sixth, what comes from the fourth. I think four and six were the ones that were important, right? Something like that. I don't know. But it's something that you just have to kind of memorize for this exam and then hopefully forget forever. Yes, four and six <laughs> were highly tested. Um, just know those very well because six always gives you a lot of problems. Yeah. Or Definitely. Um, but they really like six because of the clinical correlates that we're going to go over with you guys for these. Yes. Okay, next slide. All right, fetal circulation. So 
when a fetus is still not born, it's still in the womb, it's going to be not breathing oxygen. So you don't need that pulmonary circulation to be closed off. You don't need all of your valves, uh, all of the different chambers of your heart to be closed off because you're not really oxygenating much. Everything is like mixed blood in a fetus. So we want to understand what are the things that are open that are not open once that fetus is born. So look at this slide and then compare it to the next slide where it shows the closures of all of these pathways that connect things during fetal life. So when we close that foramen ovale that's separating those two um, atria, that's gonna give you the fossa ovalis and the limbus of the fossa ovalis. So that's the normal thing that's being derived from it. Closure of the ductus arteriosus is gonna give you the ligamentum arteriosum. And there is a clinical correlate that we know about this one that is going to keep coming back. So make sure you remember them. For the ductus venosus, you want the ligamentum venosum to be present when the child is born. If not, then it could be a pathology. For contraction and fibrosis of the umbilical veins, you want that umbilical vein to turn into that ligamentum teres hepatis. Okay. Okay, so these are the four shunts and the three most important, I would say, are going to be these. That's supposed to be a box, but clearly I'm struggling. Okay, so those are the three that you want to really understand what is going on before and what is going on after because the clinical correlates will make more sense. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. This was just kind of a summary slide. I think I pulled this from that DLA where they were introducing embryo. Just kind of be familiar with what's happening before, what's happening after, but it's not like super important. They can't really ask you many questions on this table. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, you want to know these. You want to know every part of this and what comes from them because they could ask you first order questions on it and they could ask you higher order questions on it. So on the next slide, I believe it should be on there. It might be lower down, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, here it is. Memorize this table. Like I memorized this table the day before the exam and I wish I memorized it earlier, but it makes your life a lot easier. Your truncus arteriosus is going to turn into your ascending aorta and your pulmonary trunk. Bulbus cordis is turning into the smooth parts of the left and right ventricle. There is a difference between smooth and trabeculated and they will ask you on the exam. So make sure you know what's turning into the smooth parts, what's turning into the trabeculated parts. Um, and then you guys can read the rest of them on your own time. But honestly, this is one of the slides that I would say memorize. Okay, your congenital heart defects, there are so many. So <laughs> might as well learn them now. For your Down syndrome, that's gonna be associated with a couple of different congenital heart defects, mainly that primum type ASD and the membranous type VSD but you want to look for as many buzzwords as possible so you already know what down syndrome looks like you know that it's trisomy 21 if someone starts talking about things that relate to that then you want to also look at this defect or these defects so primum type asd membranous type vsd and then it's when the endocardial cushion um defect where there's like a large defect in the atrioventricular wall so if you look at this image you can see that there is no clear separation. Oh, that is a terrible color, but I hope you can see where I was trying to draw that. <laughs> um, so because there is this huge gap between these two, you have blood moving back and forth, and that will be your defect. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so we have right to left shunts, and then you have left to right shunts. Your right to left shunts, I believe in first aid, are called your five T's. Just make sure you remember that they're all T's and it'll make your life a lot easier. And this is where you have that um, cyanosis is going to be prevalent in all of these. Next slide. So let's go through them. Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy, tetra means four. Look for the four signs that it's tetralogy of Fallot. So the first thing that's that you're looking for is that pulmonary stenosis. If you look at this is normal and this is 
the stenotic pulmonary valve. So this should be your pulmonary valve right here. And you can see it's super narrow and your aorta is huge. So that's your pulmonary stenosis part of Tetralogy of Fallot. Then we're looking at the right ventricular hypertrophy. If you think about it logically, blood is coming into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, and then into the pulmonary system. So if my pulmonary system is super narrow, I'm putting all of this pressure against that pulmonary system. In a high pressure situation, your heart tries to protect itself by hypertrophying so that it can accommodate for more blood, more pressure. So because of your, that pulmonary stenosis, you have right ventricular hypertrophy. And then you have VSD. So that VSD is going to be that malalignment. So pretty much you're saying that both of these ventricles are not separated. There's blood moving back and forth between all of these different areas. And then we have the overriding aorta. So the aorta should be more associated with your left ventricle. But in this situation, you have the aorta more towards the middle. And because we have that atrial, sep or that ventricular septal defect, blood is not moving from just the left ventricle into the aorta. You have blood from both ventricles moving into the aorta. So you just want to be able to understand all of these different parts. With Tetralogy of Fallot, this is where you have the tet spells. So you have a blue baby whenever it cries, whenever it feeds. All of these different events will cause this baby to turn blue. When you put the knees up to the chest, it kind of relieves that by putting pressure on these defects and sort of normalizing the flow of blood for a second until that um, like that cyanosis goes away. And then they'll probably turn blue in like an hour or something. But that's how you fix it temporarily. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. Oh, sorry. Okay, persistent truncus arteriosus. So this is where you have failure of the neural crest cell migration leads to failure of formation of the aortical pulmonary septum. So because you don't have an aortical pulmonary septum, you're going to have blood from everywhere moving everywhere. And so it's going to be initially mild cyanosis, but you want to associate this one with DeGeorge. They'll probably ask you a question on the exam and just give you 22 Q11 and expect you to know what this pathology is. So always associate it with your cumulative stuff too. Let's do a question. Give me one sec. We are almost done, I promise. <laughs> okay, great. So we are looking at the ductus arteriosus. If it fails to close or if it remains patent, then you would end up with transposition of the great arteries or vessels, however they wanna call it. So I think I have an explanation slide next. Yes, perfect. Okay. So this is where you have switching of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So normally you would find the aorta more associated with your left ventricle, your pulmonary trunk associated with your right ventricle. In this situation, they're switched. So it gives you severe cyanosis immediately after birth because I expect my oxygenated blood to move into my aorta to oxygenate the rest of my system. But if I'm getting deoxygenated in blood into my aorta, I'm not doing anything for any of the tissues that are supposed to receive that blood. I'm sending my oxygenated blood to the lungs. Nothing's happening there because it's already oxygenated. And then I'm sending my pretty much useless blood out into systemic circulation. So this one would be immediately lethal unless it's combined with another septal defect. So if I have a connection between my two atria, I'm giving a chance for some of that oxygenated blood to get into the aorta because there is another 
defect that's allowing blood to move from the left atrium into the right atrium and out into that misplaced aorta. And then same thing with the ventricular septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, anything that's allowing for the mixture of blood is going to give me a chance of getting some oxygenated blood out into systemic circulation, at least long enough until that can be like surgically corrected. Okay. Total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So this one is going to be where you have these weird connections between your pulmonary circulation and other blood vessels. So you would have abnormal drainage from the pulmonary veins in, uh, into the systemic venous circulation. And this is the same thing. It's going to give you severe cyanosis immediately after birth. So you need another defect in order for this to be compatible with life until it's surgically corrected. That's pretty much all this one really was saying. And these are the other ones where you have blood from the left heart going into the right heart, and these are going to be acyanotic. So there's no cyanosis because I don't have an issue with oxygenating the blood. I have an issue with getting that oxygenated blood where it needs to go and not going back to get reoxygenated. Let's move to the next one. Okay, patent ductus arteriosus. This is going to come back for the rest of your life, so please memorize these slides. <laughs> With your patent ductus arteriosus, it's the most common birth defect. It's probably going to be a lot of answers. You want to associate it with maternal rubella. Maternal rubella is going to be the one that's associated with PDA. Also, Down syndrome is going to be associated with PDA. So just kind of remember that part. What is happening here is this is supposed to turn into a ligament, right? We said that these different shunts are supposed to involute and if they remain patent then you have an issue with oxygenated blood deoxygenated blood going into the wrong areas so usually what would happen is this has to be surgically corrected and in order to keep it open long enough to have surgery because you don't want it to just stenose so in order to keep it open you would give prostaglandins and that's how you would keep it open up until that surgery point once you're done you can also give what's going to inhibit those prostaglandins is NSAIDs. So your NSAIDs are going to close that ligament or make it a ligament. So it's going to close that pathology. You just want to be able to associate those two. You're going to go into more detail later when you actually talk more about prostaglandins and NSAIDs and stuff. Okay, Eisenmenger syndrome. So this is going to be the reversal of shunt. Pretty much <clears throat> what you guys want to know is that the What's happening here is you have like this really high volume and pressure of blood that's going into your pulmonary circuit. Your pulmonary circuit we know is a low pressure system. So if you're pushing all of this super high pressure blood into that pulmonary circuit, you're going to damage the pulmonary vasculature and that's going to lead to pulmonary hypertension. After a significant amount of time of super high pressure, we said we get hypertrophy to protect our heart, right? So you would end up with some hypertrophied muscle walls in that right ventricle because that's what's pushing into the pulmonary system. Um, for this one, you just want to know late cyanosis or blue kids. That's going to be kind of your buzzword for this one. So just remember that. And then coartation of the aorta. So there's two different types. It's based on where it is in relation to this ductus arteriosus. So that if it's after the ductus arteriosus, it's postductal, which makes sense. If it's before the ductus arteriosus, it's preductal. And pretty much what's happening here is you just have this narrowing of the aorta. And so it's gonna cause, um, Oh, you want to associate this one with Turner, sorry. So you want to associate this one with Turner syndrome because it's more common in males than females, but the exception is Turner syndrome patients. So that's those are going to be the females most likely affected. And pretty much what you're having is abnormal involution of a small distal segment of the distal or the dorsal aorta. And that's going to be constricting that blood flow. So I have super high pressure blood going into my aorta. If I'm constricting it, as it's going out, then that's going to cause a lot of turbulence and it's going to also cause a lot of other defects down the line. 
And one of those things is your collateral pathway. So in order to avoid an aortic aneurysm or something, you would end up trying to shunt blood from that aorta into your inner inter, internal thoracic and your intercostal blood vessels. When your intercostal blood vessels are very distended because they're getting all of this collateral blood, they're going to kind of grip onto the costal cartilage and they leave these impressions in the costal cartilage and it's called rib notching. So you want to just understand that if you see a vignette that says rib notching, it's because there's so much pressure from that blood being collaterally put into the intercostal arteries. Next slide. Questions? Last question. Yay, I told you guys I talk fast. <laughs> what was that, like five minutes? <laughs> I need to work on that. <laughs> I need to work on that. Um, I also wanted to kind of let you guys know for the um, pain or sorry, quartification of the aorta, you, you will also potentially hear the pulse being stronger on the upper limbs and the um, jugular, like if you take a pulse there. So just be that aware of that as well as like a low pulse or like a uh, like an intermittent pulse in the femoral one. So like you guys can kind of work through the logic of why we have the collateral blood circulation and why we have high and low. So I'll give you guys a couple more seconds. Since I'm just talking about that. Kishore, do we have a QR code to our Facebook page? You're muted. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, we we don't. Um, I should set one up, but I will. Please, because I keep getting questions and I'm like, I don't know how to help you. Please look for it on Facebook. <laughs> okay, awesome. great. Kishore? <laughs> Yes, so the answer is C, the septum prime infuses with the endocardial cushioning. You guys are doing super well. Um, make sure you guys review this, this slide um, because it's not, it's not something that's super intuitive and it's hard to visualize um, in a kind of like a two dimensional space. There's a couple of YouTube videos out there that kind of um, show you the actual digital animation of this. So just a kind of general labeling septum primum, um, endocardial cushioning, right? The septum primum grows towards the endocardial cushioning and eventually closing the, um, the foramen primum, right? That's critical. What you need to keep in mind is that the space between the um, septum secundum, right, and the septum primum is essentially what becomes the fossa ovale, but initially while as an embryo or like, a, you know, your heart is developing, it maintains as a foramen. Because remember, Sarah talked about it, blood has to be coming in through circulation from the maternal side and you don't need pulmonic circulation. That's why we have this foramen physiologically, but if it persists after birth, then it becomes pathological, okay? And it closes with high pressure at birth because remember that baby takes that first breath of air in, the flap basically comes back in and closes off this structure, this foramen, and finally, um, creating like the nice septal, um, sorry, atrial, um, atrial septal border. Cool. And the septum primum and the endocardial cushion fails to fuse. It's going to basically call, cause the prime atrial defect. And if you have a large ostium secundum, that's the secundum type of atrial defect. So there are several different types of this. Um, and I have resources that I've kind of compiled that could potentially help you with this. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, those additional resources, if you guys just tap on this link, um, it will take you to the like a series of YouTube playlists if you guys are struggling with any of these concepts. But overall, that is it for our review session. Thank you for coming. Um, questions, comments, concern, I'm gonna stop the recording now. <laughs>